He is known as the brilliant and cantankerous Dr. Gregory House. It's like alchemy. It was phenomenal. He inhabits this character as few people in TV history have inhabited a series character before. There is a character we have loved to hate in the last few years, it's him. Hugh Laurie was one of Britain's most popular comic actors. But then he became a star on the American medical drama, House. It's not like he was an overnight success. I mean, the guy worked really hard for a couple of decades to get there. But behind the scenes, Laurie's battle with depression has threatened his career. Depression or gloominess has been something that he's sort of talked about as always having felt. Hugh Laurie is brilliant, and he really should realize this. He never gives himself seemingly credit for all the great accomplishments that he's had in his career. At the age of 45, Hugh Laurie achieved a whole new level of stardom. In many ways, Hugh Laurie is a late bloomer. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's what makes him good at house, is he's a real person with a real life. In the early 1990s, Hugh Laurie was one of Britain's most brilliant comic performers. The lanky actor had become a household name on television in the UK. He's a comedy actor, and what's fascinating about him is he has this, this seriousness, this intensity he brings to even the lightest roles without deadening it. Laurie's success in TV comedy led to steady film work. But in 2003, Hugh got an offer to audition for an American television pilot. In the middle of this film being done in, I believe, in, in Nambia, actually, in Africa, Hugh gets asked if he wants to audition for this, this pilot for this new American series about a grumpy, crotchety, but brilliant doctor. He actually went in the bathroom of the hotel and made his audition tape uh, there and then uh, and sent it off. Uh, one of the executive producers took one look at the footage and said, that's exactly the guy I want, a real American guy. House premiered in the fall of 2004 and found an audience right away. TV critics were impressed by Hugh's perfect American accent and loved his performance as the irritable doctor. I think Hugh Laurie is absolutely crucial for the success of House. It's almost impossible to overstate how important he is. It's a very hard role in many ways because on the one hand he's sort of this superhumanly self-confident guy, on the other hand he's this quite vulnerable guy. And you know, you can either play that or you can't. Today, the craggy British actor is an improbable American sex symbol. Recently, he's been quite taken aback at the fact that he's now regarded as a worldwide sex symbol because of House. I think he's always been nervous. He's always had insecurities about his appearance. It's astonishing. He's in his 40s, and he's gotten his big break. I mean, he's had successful movies, but this is the biggest break he can get. Anyone that travels across the pond and finds this, this sudden fame and thrust upon them, it can be terribly difficult to deal with, especially if you're not psychologically equipped to do that. Hugh Laurie battles his insecurity with intense drive and commitment to his craft. He's never been complacent. He's never just uh, coasted. He's always given 110%. James Hugh Callum Laurie was born in Oxford, England on June 11, 1959. He was the youngest of four children for Patricia and Ranald Laurie. His father served in a branch of the British military for more than a decade. Then he became a doctor at the age of 40. His father was a very well-respected doctor, um, worked for many years uh, and, and had a great reputation. And would have liked to, it would have been natural for Hugh to follow in his footsteps. But it was quite obvious quite early on that Hugh didn't have the academic uh, abilities and, and the discipline to, to knuckle down to something like medicine. Hugh was close to his father, but his relationship with his mother was strained. Young Hugh thought he would never live up to her high expectations. His relationship with his mother was a little bit more troubled. I mean, subsequently, his siblings have said, oh, you know, Hugh was the apple of his mother's eye, but he certainly didn't, it just certainly didn't feel that way to him. He said he went through months where it felt like his mother wasn't just slightly disapproving, but actively disliked him. But he, he has talked quite a lot about uh, not a great relationship with his mom, and that, you know, she just wasn't a happy person, and tended to make people around her not very happy. She came from a, a Scottish Presbyterian background, and there's a certain sort of, not just distrust of, of fun, but sort of feeling that fun, enjoying yourself, being slack is, is, is decadent. Tortured. Uh, no, not literally tortured, but I was, uh, I was a troubled child. Hugh's life at school wasn't fun either. 
He was a mediocre student. I think it was a lot of hanging out, a lot of bumming around with friends. He said his early marks in school were very unspectacular. Um, you know, didn't didn't have a lot of ambition. Um, grew his hair long. You know, wore wore grungy clothes. You know, he was probably his generation's version of a slacker. He had a tendency towards uh, being distracted. His concentration wasn't great. Anything that happened would be more interesting than what the teacher was talking about. In some interviews, Hughes mentioned that he was disruptive in class. He was a bit, perhaps a bit of a tear away. But I, I think that's very common to, to comedy practitioners. I think that's where they learn their trade and where that, if you like, that rebellious streak often does turn itself into a comedic streak in later life. Hughes' confidence grew after he discovered his silly jokes and goofy faces could make his classmates laugh. Misbehaving in class, you could say, were the first signs of his uh, comic genius. The mess about in class, distracting other pupils, making other people laugh, pulling faces, that sort of thing. There were signs even in the nine-year-old to ten-year-old Hugh Laurie that he was going to be a great comic actor. Hugh liked playing to an audience and joined the school's drama club. He won an acting award when he was nine years old. Hugh saw the smiling faces of his parents when he was on stage accepting the honor. For the first time, he felt he had won his mother's approval. That was a really important moment for him because uh, with such a, particularly such a tough mother, to see actually that approval for once, I think obviously lodged itself in his brain. And al although it wasn't to be his major thing for another sort of 10 years or so, it was obviously there as a source of, a source of approval, something he excelled at. At 13, Hugh entered the prestigious English boarding school, Eton College. He had an athletic build and decided to take up the sport of rowing. That opened up his mind. You know, he wasn't going to be a great academic, a, a, a brilliant uh, mathematician or a brilliant uh, literary uh, person, but he, he, he started rowing at school and he soon found that that was something he could excel in. For Hugh Laurie, rowing finally gave him direction, which is kind of a joke in the sense if you know anything about rowing, because of course where you're going is what the sport is all about. But more importantly, I think it also made him feel a part of something. Before, as a child, you know, he came from a family where there was a lot of love, but I think he felt that he wasn't part of something. Rowing gave him both focus and it both, in a sense, gave him a new family. Hugh Laurie was an exceptional young athlete on his way to becoming a world-class rower, but a serious illness would force him to quit the sport he loved and lead him to a group of artists who would change his life. In the early 70s, Hugh Laurie was an unfocused student at his British prep school. That changed after Laurie joined the rowing team at Eton College, where he learned the value of discipline. In 1977, Hugh placed first at the National Junior Rowing Championships and fourth at the World Juniors in Finland. As a young teenager, he shot up from being a sort of small lad to being a tall, athletic teenager and rowing was perfectly suited to him and he loved it and he really, he really took to it. Laurie's athletic skills won him a place at Cambridge University where he studied archaeology and anthropology. He rowed for one of the school's junior teams. Both Oxford and Cambridge are very keen to have rowers in their colleges because of the annual boat race which has been going on for well, over 100 years. And Hugh was very fortunate in uh, uh, getting a place at Selwyn College, Cambridge, the same college as his father, incidentally, um, because of his rowing abilities. Laurie's father, Ranald, was a member of Cambridge's champion rowing teams in 1936 and 37. But Hugh discovered his father's athletic success by accident. One day, Hugh was rooting around in the attic, uh, looking at some old things, uh, tidying up. Uh, and he came across a box, and in the box was an old sock picked up the sock, felt something in it, looked at it, and to his amazement was an Olympic gold medal. And it was only then that he, uh, he found out his father had actually been such a successful oarsman that he'd actually won a gold medal at the 1948 Olympics. Laurie was stunned by the revelation. He didn't want to follow his father into medicine, but now he hoped he could impress him by becoming a world-class rower. Well, I think Hugh would have liked to have uh, pleased his father and done well at school and followed his father's footsteps. But on the other hand, I think one thing that delighted his father was Hugh's success at rowing. Laurie trained for hours every day to improve his performance. But in 1979, he felt his stamina slipping away. He was unusually tired and lethargic. Doctors told him he had mononucleosis. Hugh had to give up the rowing because he got 
glandular fever, mononucleosis, you know, was one of those things that holds on for, for months at a time. And that was a, that was a tough blow for him. He couldn't continue his rowing. And it really, I think it threw him off kilter. I, recently, he said something about uh, don't make plans for the future because the future doesn't work out as you plan. Laurie was sidelined by his illness. With his rigorous training schedule gone, he was bored and restless. He had often had his rowing team in stitches with his clever jokes and stories. His friends encouraged him to audition for the Cambridge Footlights Dramatic Club. Footlights is famous for finding comedians and comedy actors from the, from the upper classes, if you like, or from the upper middle classes. Um, people like Peter Cook and Alan Bennett from Beyond the Fringe, firm favourites at Footlights. There's been a long tradition of very, very famous comics having once trod their, trod their stuff at Footlights and then gone on to greater things. This rather dingy looking basement is actually the entrance to the Footlights Club Room. This is where the committee members for the Cambridge Footlights each year, including Hugh Laurie back in the 79, 80, 81, they meet each week and they'd rehearse here and come up with their comedy shows. They perform the shows even down here as well. When he started with the Footlights, you get the sense that he had really found his kindred souls. I mean, he, he got along well with rowers, but there was this other side of him, this, this comedic uh, side just waiting to burst out. It had been more than a decade since Hugh won a drama award in prep school, but he easily won a role in the Footlights pantomime production of Aladdin. He also won the heart of his co-star, a 20-year-old actress named Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson tells the story of how being with him there and acting with Hugh she just thought he was the funniest guy she'd ever seen. And you get the sense that their relationship was built on a mutual sense of humor and sort of a mutual creative passion for the stage. Hugh's romantic relationship with Emma Thompson didn't last very long. You know, I think they kind of figured out early on, we're not really good at this, but we're great friends, and so they're very close friends to this day. As Laurie slowly recuperated from glandular fever, he became more involved in the footlights. He wrote and starred in many of their comedy productions. He tripped into this group of immensely talented actors, and so he just thrived there. It doesn't surprise me that Hugh would stand out with Footlights, because he's just a naturally witty guy. If you do an interview with him, as I've done a few times, he's just the funniest guy imaginable and very self-deprecating. Uh, you could just see him, he's got that kind of hangdog expression. You could just, the things that come out of his mouth based on the, his, his facial expressions, you know, the combination is just, it priceless. Laurie's comedic style and sense of timing was not confined to the stage. Emma Thompson tells a funny story from the Footlights days where the Footlights team were returning in a van home from a gig and they heard on the radio that uh, the police were looking for someone who'd been kidnapped in a very similar van to their own. So Hugh Laurie, a passenger in, in the van, started thrashing about as if he was the kidnapped victim in the hope that maybe the police would stop them in this mistaken identity. Uh, but apparently his antics were so funny that Emma Thompson literally had to stop the car and get out before she wet herself. Laurie loved writing and performing with the footlights, but his passion for rowing remained strong. It took Hugh months to recover from glandular fever. As soon as his doctor gave the okay, he was back on the water training. Laurie was elated when he was chosen to row for Cambridge in the annual race against bitter rival Oxford University. The great competition between Oxford and Cambridge is the Oxford and Cambridge Boat Race, this yearly festival when, uh, when teams from both universities race against each other down the Thames. The sole purpose of this boat club is to put together a team to beat Oxford in the boat race each year. In 1980, Hugh Laurie rode in that race. They lost to Oxford by a matter of feet, and he says he's never actually recovered from that. Hugh was just crushed, and to this day, 27 years later, he's still crushed. It's just one of those things that stays with you and you probably feel like you have to overcome it. Cambridge University's defeat to Oxford delivered a huge blow to Hugh Laurie's rowing dreams. He decided he might be better off performing. Hugh would soon join forces with another brilliant young comedian. Together, they would become the new faces of British comedy. Hugh Laurie missed becoming a champion rower by less than a boat length in the 1980 Oxford-Cambridge boat race. But he had found kindred spirits in a theatrical group known as the Footlights. In 1980, he showed off his talent to TV audiences for the first time when he appeared on a BBC chat show with fellow actor and former girlfriend Emma Thompson. His very first TV exposure was on 